The desire to overcome death is nothing new. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the first recorded story of human history, accounts on clay tablets a mythical king's quest for immortality. Four thousand years later, humans are still searching for immortality. With the modernization of healthcare, encouraged by biotechnology and computer science, remarkable gains have been made in extending human lifespans. A child born today can expect to live more than three times longer than in the time of Gilgamesh. Stem cells, caloric restriction, cryonics, nanotechnology, and transhumanism have become the watchwords of our era. Perhaps with the accumulation of these accelerating advancements, we are indeed on the verge of a complete reversal of the biological aging process, regenerative medicine in our lifetimes. And if so, if we are able to overcome aging and then live forever, what would this mean for religion? What would this mean for governments and social systems which rely on a noble and timely death? Perhaps once we've conquered aging, we'll no longer even wish to stay as vulnerable humans. Perhaps we'll expedite our progression from immortal beings into cyborgs and then to completely post-human entities. But now there are more pressing questions. What about the environment? Oppression by the wealthy over the poor? The problem of overpopulation? What about boredom? with a life that stretches out forever. And even more ominous, what if the universe were to end itself in a whimper, a long, expanding heat death into the infinite? If so, what's the point in trying to live forever anyway? While it's impossible to answer all of these questions within one documentary, we can provide a glimpse, a brief snapshot in time, from the voices of the visionaries at the forefront. Join us as we take this amazing journey, exploring life extension, an Immortality Institute film. There's a lot of things that I want to do, and I don't think I would ever get bored. Um, I really value life. I love life, and I don't want it to end, ever. I don't want to put a limit on the number of years or centuries or millennia that I want to live. Um, there may come a time in my life where I don't want to live anymore, but that's not right now. Um, I, want, I don't want to have a limit. At some point, humans would be able to take care of all of our medical problems. I just never thought it would be possible in my lifetime. And now for the first time I am seriously thinking that it could be possible in my lifetime. We induced trance, really, where we have convinced ourselves of this absurdity that aging is actually a good thing. Um, you know, that's all it is, it's a trance. It's my job to wake people up and the only real way to do it is to present actual factual information in other words, to develop, to do experimental work in the laboratory that, dem that shows incontrovertibly that aging can be very dramatically altered. And the oldest person in the world that we know of who's been documented by the Guinness Book of Records is named Jean Calmet, a French lady who died at the age of 122 in the year 1997. But we see now that we have tools to attack the problem. And if we fail to do so, we're going to die. And the next generation, or the next generation after that, will, will wake up and see it, you know, and they will be the benefiters. And it's, the burden is upon us, the people that know, you and I, that know, you know, we have the responsibility because we know that the, the average citizen or the average population does, don't know what we know, and so they don't have that responsibility. But we need to, you know, we need to enlighten enough people to, uh, to make an effect while, while we can, so we can benefit ourselves and all the people we care about. You may hit 85 or 90, you know, um, and, um, you know, if we push everyone out to that level, well, let's see, you know, I'm 48 now, you know, if I can, if I can get to 80, you know, that's another 30 years, that pushes me to, uh, 
2034. And if we don't have robust, tech, you know, really pretty robust stem cell technology, you know, even beginning nanotechnology by 2034, I would be very, very surprised. Yeah, I love to live, and uh, I want to live more, and uh, I don't think there's anything else after that. So uh, this is my motivation for working on aging research. Yes, where technology has an interface with your body, with the human body. Uh, we've got stents in our hearts. We take all these sort of things for granted. You know, contact lenses. Now, now, they're, now we're implanting contact lenses and doing laser surgery. These, these are all things that seemed real radical at one time. Uh, like you said, you know, heart pacemakers and now artificial hearts. Uh, they just become, uh, at first, uh, big news. Uh, second, uh, something that everybody wants if they need them. And third, something that everybody takes for granted once they get them or once, they, once everybody else had them for a while. It's very frustrating to know these super rich superheroes have decided to focus on uh, what's really of long term importance to the human race and to intelligence on Earth, which, in my view, the two most important things right now that anyone can work on are probably human life extension and artificial intelligence. Like, I, I tend to think that like, this century is like the gateway century you know, by that by that I mean like we will either destroy ourselves this century or we will attain immortality it's the rational part of my mind against the part of my mind that truly wants to believe in an afterlife to know that if there's nothing afterwards what does that mean for me and it makes it worth that that doubt makes it worth doing everything I can to make sure that that I and others who are unsure have an opportunity to live as long as possible. And if we can live just enough, just make it long enough, I believe that technology will advance enough to where some few lucky of us will never have to die. It's not a matter of whether there will never be life extension, because I don't think that they're ever going to be able to forbid life extension. It's a matter of how aggressively we pursue it. And, and I think Nick Bostrom's recent fable uh, of the dragon you know, puts this very clearly. Uh, if you see that there will be a time when negligible senescence or, or completely delayed aging is possible, and you see a time when all the diseases that kill people today can be cured, then it's not a matter of uh, you know, that the, this nev future is never going to get here. It's that all these people are going to die unnecessarily. If we could get it 20 years sooner, all these people would be saved. You have to raise the legitimacy. We, we had done over 10 or 15 years, had brought up homosexuality and made it a legitimate issue for discussion. And I think that's what's going on now with, it, with the immortality issue. They said, here and there, they're, they're getting coherent people or people of increasing stature coming out and saying, why not? You know, why shouldn't we try to have at least extreme life extension, which would create less... Somehow when you say immortality, remember that the Greek gods were called the immortals. So in a way, when you start saying that you're an immortalist, it's almost like, once again, in the interest of saying, you know, you're a god. You're claiming to be god. You know, wow. I mean, talk about blasphemy big time mainstream phraseology of life extension and, and life extension is a mainstreamable version of immortality. Immortality is just not polite in mixed company to, to use that word because it evokes to people either um, anti-godliness or um, it evokes to people a kind of a uh, bravado of, of um, or ubris that one you know thinks that they are a god. Um, in fact, in my experience, the immortalists don't think of themselves as gods at all. They think of themselves as, as mere mortals that want to enjoy uh, learning and loving forever. And uh, that's, that's all I think immortalists see in the word immortality. They don't get into all the other definitions. If you ask a medical professional now, when is someone dead? They will say, well, no pulse, no respiration, no brain activity. Then you say, but you resuscitate people from that condition all the time, don't you? Well, yes, we do. Well, then they couldn't have been dead. Well, no, they weren't, because they weren't pronounced legally dead. So it's just a legal fiction, as far as I'm concerned. But it's very useful, because once that pronouncement has been made, a legal line is crossed, allowing us to intervene, 
using our own equipment, our own medications. I don't think in terms of how long do I want to live, just how long can I live. Um, I'm, I'm not quite as far towards the idea of, I don't think I'm like an absolutist and more, a moralist, I'm just going to keep pushing the technology and doing everything I can to extend my life. I don't see a point at which I would want to say I don't want to live anymore. If they do have to create their own eternity, they want to create a good one, and so they're laying down the right steps now. Um, and also, if we do develop physical immortality, which is what I think we will develop, um, <clears throat> I think that will bring a built-in incentive for people to live more lives because you could, you know, if you get the death penalty when people are immortal, they can live forever. That's a whole lot worse than the death penalty to a mortal person. I think that the quest for immortality is not only noble, it, it, it imbues us with a noblesse oblige. That those that achieve this are under an obligation to serve society, to serve back to humanity. And I think that we will have a lot to contribute. Growing to more than 100,000 members since 1980, the Life Extension Foundation is the world's largest organization dedicated to investigating scientific methods for preventing aging and death. Members of the Life Extension Foundation typically are extremely dedicated to maintaining themselves in an optimal state of health. Many of them simply want to live as long as they can without suffering the debilitating effects of aging. Some of them are very hardcore. They actually want to live forever, as I do. They don't, they don't want to die. They don't believe people have to die if science advances fast enough to overcome the molecular changes that are involved in aging and death. Trying to define more accurately the process of aging has been challenging for scientists. While the outward appearance of aging on the human body seems obvious, finding exact biomarkers that accurately measure this process has been elusive. We do age, but we don't age at the same pace. So the question is, why, do we, why are we old at 80 instead of 18? And what's so magic about the number 80? Why not 100? Why not 200? I mean, mice are old at age 3. Well, there's a big difference between 80 and 3, but why not longer? The difference must then not be uh, structural, must not be, uh, we don't age because of the passage of time, we age because uh, we have, uh, our biochemistry allows us to age, or we age more slowly because our biochemistry allows us to age more slowly. But I, I, tend, I tend to look more uh, of this process as, as, again, as I said before, as linked to development, uh, which is a well-orchestrated, genetically determined process. And uh, then aging occurs indirectly um, because of this same set of processes. And the pace at which developmental processes occurs then um, also influences the pace in which aging occurs. My current research at UCLA involves supercentenarians, people who are more than 110 years old, because that is the group of individuals who can tell us the secret, if they could, of what are the limits of human lifespan. I think that therapeutic cloning is uh, probably the most practical you know, technique that we have for treating aging, because you can in theory, I mean, even in practice as well these days, take a cell, uh, do nuclear transfer, make embryonic stem cells, and then differentiate those embryonic stem cells into whatever uh, cell types you need to treat, the, you know, whichever disease you want, age-related disease you want to treat. And, um, you know, one example might be, uh, you know, one practical way that, you know, you could treat the whole body possibly would be to make bone marrow stem cells from the embryonic stem cells, from the rejuvenated embryonic stem cells, and then, uh, you know, seed those young bone marrow cells into the body, and they they will automatically find their way into the into the bone marrow, and then because the because it's now known that the bone marrow, uh, you know replenishes a lot of other cells in the body, like in the vascular endothelium. 
then that way maybe you could sort of rejuvenate the vascular endothelium by by uh, make, giving people uh, younger bone marrow. I think the, uh, the point of view of Rafal and the Aubrey and the others is basically correct that there may not be one magic bullet, but if we design therapies that will extend human life by 50 years, during those 50 years we can resolve the remaining problems through exponential advancement in science. So it's, it's not clear now whether it's going to be a mitochondrial gene therapy vector, uh, genetic nuclear therapy, or whether it's going to be a, a chemical compound. I, I don't think that's clear. There's a lot of details to work out with the mechanisms. UCLA biologist Dr. Michael Rose established the evolutionary connection between sex and death by breeding fruit flies. Dr. Rose has selected only those flies that reproduced late in life and bred them with one another. The longer it took the insects to reproduce, the longer they lived. He now has flies that live more than 130 days instead of the usual 40. And you go from this almost vertical increase in mortality rates to a, maybe a gentle, gentle increase in mortality rates, a, a bobbling up and down in mortality rates. This is amazing. It's one of the more incredible I know vast numbers of colleagues in cell biology won't agree with the following statement, but I think that the fundamental scientific issues in aging are largely resolved. By fundamental, I mean really fundamental. The way a physicist would consider them fundamental. Not the way a biologist would consider them fundamental. To a biologist, a new pathway is fundamental. To me, it isn't. Uh, you know, there are lots of pathways, genetic pathways and biochemical pathways in organisms. That doesn't mean that aging isn't a huge practical problem and it's of enormous interest in terms of actually producing interventions in human aging if you know the person is interested in that and I think that's a as valuable if not more important technological issue than you know building a better internet or a faster car or traveling to the moon or any of those other technological issues what we can accomplish but in addressing problems like uh, traveling to the moon you're solving vast numbers of engineering problems vast numbers of detailed problems and not doing fundamental science um, in the same way, I, I regard postponing aging in humans in the same category as taking a person to the moon. It will require a vast amount of engineering and a great deal of scientific expertise, but it, in itself it isn't really scientifically fundamental. So I'm a scientist, and what I'm most interested in my scientific research, as opposed to my involvement in any kind of practical activity, is the deepest questions. And the deepest questions to me right now are revolved around biological immortality. What is it all about? Something we really didn't understand existed before the 1990s in organisms like ourselves. We knew that it existed in organisms like sea anemones, um, creosote, juniper, uh, trembling aspen, um, some hydra, uh, simple cilentrate. Uh, nobody was really studying that uh, phenomenon because nobody really cared that much because most people who work on aging do it from a medical standpoint, which means humans, or if not humans, then certainly mammals, uh, and all these organisms that didn't have an aging process were far removed from mammals. We now know that all mammals, more precisely all the evidence suggests that all mammals undergo a cessation of aging very late in their life cycle and from that point on aging stopped so that life can be thought of as being divided into three basic stages. The first one is your development growth to maturation. The second part is your aging phase which starts just about when you're mature and then continues for a very long time but then finally stops when you enter a third phase, a phase of biological immortality in which aging no longer occurs and you have, in the case of many organisms, but not all, a very low survival probability per year which doesn't really systematically degrade with time. And that third phase, which has not really been explored by contemporary biology, is what interests me now, late life. We know that calorie restriction is the most documented way to extend our lifespan. We're looking for uh, nutrients, drugs, hormones that have the same effect on our genome as does calorie restriction. If, if we believe that there's a good chance that technology will become available in the, in the next 10, 20, 30 years uh, to dramatically extend our lives uh, or to give us uh, indefinite lifespans, then of course the most important thing is to stay alive long enough to, you know, to benefit from that, from that technology 
and that's uh, one of the main reasons why I'm doing calorie restriction because it uh, very dramatically reduces the, the risk of dying of the killer diseases. And that's why caloric restriction works is because if you run the mitochondria leaner, which is what you do when you're basically calorically restricted, okay, then they produce less free radicals, then the free radicals don't damage the nuclear DNA, then you don't get the double strand break problem or they damage it at a slower rate. To me, caloric restriction is eating just enough food to sustain your body and making sure that you get enough vitamins and nutrients. Amazing advance in the understanding of aging that we have now, I suppose in 1995, is really obvious. Like caloric restriction research wasn't even really started then. And all these mechanisms that Aubrey de Grey is talking about, they were barely inklings at that point in time. So there's, there's just no arguing with the amount of advance that's, that's gone on. It's, uh, why shouldn't it work in humans? I mean, there are species that live longer than us, so uh, caloric restriction uh, may allow us to push our, our limits a little bit further. Uh, I don't think we've reached the, the limits of human longevity, not at all. Putting things in sharp perspective, University of Cambridge gerontologist Dr. Aubrey de Grey calls aging a barbaric phenomenon that shouldn't be tolerated in polite society. The main reason why people feel that curing aging would be a bad idea, and that, that in other words, conversely, that aging itself is actually a good thing, is as a coping strategy. Yes, people don't think that there's any prospect of doing anything about aging, and think that aging is fundamentally horrible. Um, the only real way to, um, you know, to, to, to put it out of one's mind is to convince oneself that it's actually not so bad after all. But if you took a, take a look at the population in general, I would say most people are skeptical about anti-aging research. They they, they don't think it's possible to, um, to slow down human aging within a, uh, a reasonable future. And so, if you can show that, for instance, it is possible to reverse aging in mice, or it is possible to reverse or delay, even if to a small degree, aging in, in old people, uh, I think that would bring a lot of attention to the field, and it would give people the feel, sensation that real anti-aging um, interventions are within their grasp. But the rate of progress of understanding is just incredible. So it's almost like there's a, there's a Moore's Law of biological understanding going on. Just like every 18 months computer processing speed is sped up by roughly a factor of two. It seems like in the last 10-15 years, every couple years there's a revolutionary new tools, new understanding in molecular biology. And if that happens for another eight or ten years, it seems pretty likely to me that we're going to come to a, a radical new understanding of, of aging. Typically researchers are very conservative people. Now, aging researchers or people who are involved in aging are typically a little more optimistic than most people, but maybe uh, the researchers are typically pretty conservative. So uh, we, had a, we posed a question, in the future, when would you think people would say aging was solved or cured or what have you? And uh, like when, when would you say polio, you know, for example, was cured? People still get polio very rarely, but, uh, and people would maybe still age, but uh, basically when would they say aging was cured? And um, we threw out the extreme high and the extreme low, and we came up with an average or a mean of, I think it was, uh, it was uh, 2019, and to me that, that was shocking because I thought I was really far out there in, in, in my optimism. I picked uh, 2030. People have to, have, to, have to understand that aging is a disease, and, uh, and usually when I ask the question, I ask how long would you, would you live if you, if you could live as long as possible in a youthful condition. Aging, then, is a disease affecting our DNA. It is the continuous accumulation of mutations, both in the nuclear and the mitochondrial genome. Hard to tell which genome is more important for aging. It would appear that uh, the nuclear genome is more important for cancer. Uh, however, the mitochondrial genome uh, may be just as important or perhaps even more important uh, for things like diabetes, 
uh, or Alzheimer's disease. Right now, jury's out, but uh, one way or another, uh, aging is caused by accumulation of damage in the, uh, in the DNA. Aging is absolutely a disease. It is the ultimate disease that kills everyone who doesn't succumb to some other disease first. Uh, aging will be curable. Aging is the, the advancement, essentially, of our DNA to the point where we become debilitated, to the point where the cells no longer function. Uh, at our biomarker research laboratories, we're able to look at various genes that affect the aging process. And we've been able to show how the introduction of certain drugs and nutrients can actually positively affect those genes so that the ones that cause us to grow old are turned off and some of the ones that enable cells to stay healthy are turned back on. So we've been able to do, uh, in a relatively small way at this point in time, some manipulation into the aging process using available medications and nutrients. While advancements in biotechnology continue to add healthy years to human lifespan, there are individuals who express concern about this trajectory. Daniel Callahan, co-founder of the Hastings Center, says that there is no known social good coming from the conquest of death. And the worst possible way to resolve this issue is to leave it up to individual choice. The President's Council on Bioethics, headed by Dr. Leon Cass, exemplifies what is sometimes referred to as deathism, a longing for eventual death. In an article entitled, Why Not Immortality?, Dr. Cass writes that victory over mortality is the unstated but implicit goal of modern medical science. However, Dr. Cass continues by writing that immortals cannot be noble and that the finitude of human life is a blessing for every human individual, whether he knows it or not. The argument that Cass makes is not an argument. One assertion that Cass makes is he says the immortals cannot be noble, which is a hilarious statement to make. Uh, for some reason, he thinks that very short lived beings who are very stupid, don't have time to develop themselves, become mature, learn from experiences before they die, i.e., human beings, they can be noble apparently. But beings who can live indefinitely, acquire wisdom or experiences, learn from life, some, for some reason they cannot be noble, he says. So I think he has it absolutely backwards. Um, my view is that when we've lived a few hundred years, a few thousand years, however long, we'll look back on who we are today, these very primitive human beings, purely biological, and we'll think, what callow, shallow people those were. My goodness, they tried their best, those poor creatures back there, those very limited brains they had, uh, driven by their genes and their hormones, really quite helpless, poor beings. But my goodness, we can do so much better now. Well, in a sense, Leon Cass is an advocate of euthanasia, you know, encouraging people to believe that death is somehow good for them. And uh, you know, the question I would pose is, you know, which is more noble, um, trying to convince people that death is in somehow you know, a good thing for you, or somebody that's trying to actually save people's lives? Immortals cannot be noble. Mr. Cass, what do you know about immortals? Right? I couldn't disagree more uh, with this kind of approach. I think that uh, people like Leon Cass um, are missing, missing what it is to be human. They claim that to be human, you have to die, that uh, death is what gives meaning to our lives. Uh, another person quoted here, William Herbert, Harold Burt uh, says that um, that dependency gives us a sense of meaning, meaningful connection within the journey of our lives. I really, really don't agree. And it's as simple as that. It's a gut disagreement. Uh, and I don't think I need to provide any special arguments. Uh, any person who looks into his heart and sees appreciation of death um, I think is missing the point. I think life is about uh, being alive, uh, about uh, learning more about the world, about uh, cooperating with other people in being alive and exploring the world and you know maybe even reaching for the stars one day. That is what it, what it is to be human. That's the meaning of life. What if life's meaning really does relate to working out your your 
salvation with fear and trembling, as it says in the Bible? What if, what if it does relate to something beyond physical existence? And many, many people who've lived very rich physical lives are joyful at the face of their death because they feel like those lives are about something even more full and rich. What if it does? What if, what if the very nature of life is such that, that an infinite number of recreational trips, an infinite number of books, an infinite number of this or that does not lead to, to any richer happiness, but that in fact being part of a drama of frailty and finitude where we actually give to one another of our very substance and sometimes even die doing it. What if that's what it's about? I mean, to me, the scenario that, that is painted by, by infinite immortality of the physical type at least in the mode that I know the world, doesn't have nearly the crispness of drama and the power of significance that the story of, of those who have sacrificed themselves for others does have. Well, there are poets. If you read Cass, he sounds like a poet. But uh, once, you, once you strip down all the flowery verbiage, it's very simple. Death is good. Disease is good. And as a scientist and as a physician, that's something I simply disagree with. I'd be happy to step aside and let other people have their three score and, and, and ten. I'd rather they had four score or maybe six score. Although it starts to get edgy at that point. I think over a hundred starts to get edgy. I think that um, individuals such as Dr. Cass and Dr. Fukuyama and Dr. Hobart um, are justified in much of the reasoning and I think that they seem to care about their lives and the lives of people around them. And I think that they do believe that they are on a correct path. But their correct path is not the path for everyone. Their value system is not the value system for everyone. And it's not saying that their values are wrong or bad, or that those who are advocates of super longevity are wrong or bad. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that the premise by which they base their values, the premise of believing in a shortened lifespan and believing in death as being a sin quo non, are not the wave of the future. They are simply not paying attention to all the advances that are going on. And they're not paying attention to the fact that those of us who are involved in super longevity, life extension, and working on organizations such as the Immortality Institute, Alcor Foundation, Extropy Institute, Transhumanist Arts and Culture, are individuals who are very involved in our work. Uh, most of us have um, a strong career path, uh, are educated, many PhDs, masters, individuals who, whether they're degreed or not, have spent a tremendous amount of time working in their field, um, that we have thought about these things, we've contemplated them, contemplated them uh, to the degree that I think is, is substantial and certainly we don't know everything, but most of us have a pretty good spin on what's going on when you take Dr. Uh, Michael West and Dr. Max Moore and, and Ray Kurzweil and um, Aubrey de Grey, Dr. de Grey and um, Michael Rose and, and you know, just all of the, the, our friends in our community and, and our colleagues in our community and think about the tremendous amount of work that they have put forth, I, there is, it, it doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense that, uh, that Dr. Fukuyama, Dr. Cass would um, make such rash and abrupt statements about uh, those of us who are transhumanists. The Life Extension Foundation's initial mission was to fund research aimed at achieving physical immortality. Regrettably, the FDA got on our way. They were interfering with certain scientists who were doing research projects that were very, very critical. They were interfering with the ability of our members to access documented anti-aging therapies. They even came in and raided our facility several times and seized all of the supplements that we were offering. So we were forced to go to war with the FDA. Since then, we have won numerous victories in court. We've protected the First Amendment right for supplement companies to tell the truth to the public about what dietary supplements may really do. Probably our biggest victory was getting enough uh, supplement users in the United States. We're talking about literally millions and millions of Americans 
to write letters to Congress, to fax Congress, to call Congress, and demand in 1994 that the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act be passed. And that was passed by an overwhelming majority. And that single act has resulted in more dietary supplements being available than ever before at lower prices and, and significant innovations in this unregulated area of, of health care, as opposed to the regulated prescription drug market where you don't have a lot of innovation, you get a lot of side effects, a lot of deaths, and very high prices. We evaluate all of the published scientific literature and then we reduce that into a lay format for publication into our 110 page monthly magazine called Life Extension Magazine. We also summarize all of our findings into a 1600 page book called Disease Prevention and Treatment. And we make that book available every other year to our members and that essentially summarizes the best scientific methods of treating or preventing 129 diseases that the medical community has overlooked. The, the, these ways that are documented in scientific studies that are not being applied in clinical medical settings. The prospect of human life extension is being discussed by leaders around the world. While addressing the 8th annual Millennium Evening at the White House in 1999, President Clinton stated, we want to live forever and we're getting there. He also added that we've treated the Human Genome Project like a priority every year because we all want to live forever. A few business and business leaders are beginning to fund aging research. Larry Ellison, chief executive of Oracle, has contributed more than $20 million per year for aging research. In 2001, Larry Ellison said, Death has never made any sense to me. How can a person be there and then just vanish, just not be there? Death makes me very angry. Premature death makes me angrier still. The cradle rocks above an abyss. And common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. Nature expects a full-grown man to accept the two black voids fore and aft as stolidly as he accepts the extraordinary visions in between. Imagination, the supreme delight of the immortal and the immature, should be limited. In order to enjoy life, we should not enjoy it too much. I rebel against this state of affairs. Vladimir Nabokov. You don't say, well, I'm going to die, therefore life must not be all that good. You say, I'm going to die, this is absolutely horrible, and then you keep your brain in that mode. You don't go shifting around to say, what you don't look for consolations. You're not supposed to be consoled. You're going to die. It's horrible. You should do something about it. Uh, the reality is most of us kind of ignore, ignore that big elephant in the living room and pretend that uh, we're not heading rapidly toward aging and death. Um, the very few right now, percent on a percentage basis, are taking the extremely rational step of saying, well, cryonics may not be a guarantee, but it's certainly the most rational, scientifically valid thing I can do right now to perhaps beat the reaper. I mean, I've talked about that with the children some. I mean, uh, sometimes when they're going to sleep, you know, a little kid like the five-year-old, I mean, he'll just get, have an emotional reaction. And he'll actually cry about, you know, I don't want to die. And I mean, just what is death? And I mean, I, I very much think that uh, some of the world's religions, I mean, that's uh, kind of an answer. I do have some relatives who don't understand. Some of my friends not so much friends as acquaintances, um, work colleagues and so on, generally don't think, if they don't think that living longer is better, it's because they are looking forward to an afterlife that is going to be better. And I'm not going to say for sure that there isn't one, but I don't know for sure that there is. And I know that there's this life because I'm living it. Oh, that's a hard a uh, question to answer. You know, since I'm a, I'm a researcher and ev pretty much everything I do is based on facts or um, any of the kind of predictions I make is sort of based on what I see. And I don't know that we can say anything about what happens after death because no one knows. We can't go there and look. You can't go and look and see that there's nothing. And you can't go and look and see that there is something. Um, so, you know, given that we don't know, I just tend to, I tend to not think about it very much. Um, mind you, I think that there is an interesting question, 
that comes up is if we can, you know, in that if we can live forever, what does that say about God? What does that say about our conception of God? Does God exist? You know, are we, um, are we God's sibling now? Well, there's no evidence that, you know, we actually, our consciousness exists after we die. So, um, I think the people that say that, or people that object to the no that notion, are in some kind of denial that that's the reality of the situation. And if you look at it objectively, you know, um, there really is no, no evidence of, you know, any existence outside of this one. Well, I personally don't believe that there's anything after death either, so I have a significant motivation to make life extension a reality. Uh, I have a lot of motivation to keep myself very healthy. I personally take over a hundred different supplements a day of drugs, vitamins, hormones, whatever I am able to uncover in the scientific literature that looks like it will extend my lifespan, I personally take it. And I write about it and publish it in our magazine, and many of our members want to follow the same direction that I and our scientific advisory board is doing. Because most of us have been brought up um, under fairly religious backgrounds, fairly religious teachings, and, and um, we tend to conform. We're wired to conform. And this is, this is a really great instance where you're much better off thinking for yourself if you can and trying to ignore what you've been taught. I don't know about other people, but I think if I die, that's it for me. Nothing happens. I, I, I'd answer it by saying I just don't know and nobody knows. Nobody, nobody knows there's an afterlife, and nobody knows there's not an afterlife. I, if I had to bet on it, I'd say there's, there's no afterlife, and I am betting on it. I'm, I'm putting my heart and soul into aging research because I want to hang around. I don't want to take a chance. I'd be happily surprised if there was one if I died. You know, but I, but nobody really knows that. I think that's a moot point. Obviously, if there. There, I think actually I would say that there, I'd take that back a little bit, I'd say there is an entity that's going to take care of us after death, that entity is us. That's the collective activities of all of us uh, people, which is uh, our collective consciousness and, and our will to build an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent entity, which is our collective technology and our collective consciousness. And that entity is by definition God, so I'd say that uh, God will be there when we become God. I personally think that once, you, once you're dead, it's over. Um, I do not subscribe to, to any of the stories about the afterlife. Uh, I think it's not impossible, but uh, there's no evidence, no evidence that would uh, convince me that this indeed occurs. I do not believe in the existence of a soul. Um, I don't think that uh, after destruction of the brain, there's anything left of my memories or myself. Um, and of course, I would want to find out, uh, although perhaps this is not, not the right way of uh, saying that, um, the only way you can find out what happens is uh, if you die and, uh, and if it turns out that there's nothing going on, then you don't really find out, right? So this is this is something that I would like to avoid. I would prefer not to even know. Uh, stay alive, and um, avoid the risk of of uh, there be there be nothing nothing left. There's an interesting dichotomy between almost everybody in this country and in this world. Either they believe that when they die, they're definitely going somewhere. And almost certainly it's a pretty good place to go to. Not many people are convinced they're going to the bad places. So that's okay. They're comfortable with that idea so they can deal with death. Or they want to be absolutely sure they'll live forever on Earth. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to be a rational transhumanist and say, well, I can have a really good shot at living indefinitely, but I may not make it. I may get squashed tomorrow in a car accident. I may just not make it. That's a pretty uncomfortable position. And I think people like, like Herbert and Cass, they built the whole worldview on this idea of death being inevitable and necessary and my goodness, if it's not, 
what a disaster that means for all of history before now, which is really a terrible thing. And what if I don't make it? What a terrible thing. And if that limit is taken away, we're not mortal anymore, what am I going to do with my life? What, what does that all mean? And they don't want to deal with those issues. And so they'd rather just say, it can't happen, and it'd be bad if it did. When people are asked how long they want to live, the usual response is 80 or 90 years. Most people equate increased chronology with increased physical disability and eventual death. But when people come to understand that the effects of aging can be reversed, objections emerge. It seems that many people think that greater extension of lifespan will disrupt the so-called natural order. And that's a misconception. What we considered natural in uh, the 1200s is not natural today. And what we consider natural today will not be natural tomorrow. I hear that type of thing all the time. And my standard answer is human beings have gone against the natural order of things ever since time began. Um, just a half a millennia ago, the average lifespan for a human being was roughly 25 years old. If you lived to be 30 or 35, you were considered an extremely old individual. Now, we routinely live into our 80s and 90s. I guess you can make the argument that that's going against the natural order of things as well, but what it is is an example of science and the technological progress that we've made in ex not only extending our lives, but enabling us to live healthier and more active lives well into our 70s and 80s. A thousand years ago, people lived uh, on average uh, 35 to 40 years. I mean adults, I'm not even including uh, the children who were dying in, in droves at age 5 or 2 or 1. Uh, so what we're doing right now is unnatural for uh, the vast majority of, of citizens to reach the age of 70 or 80. And I think it's good to be unnatural in, in this way. I think that there are lots of things that are natural that I don't like, and dying is one of them. Um, maybe I would be dead of a number of natural diseases if there weren't unnatural antibiotics and treatments for them. So natural by itself is not necessarily a good thing. Natural resources in this world, the existing resources, are enough to feed about and house about six billion more people. So you can basically double the population without stretching, without, and that's not including any future technologies, that's not including seabed mining, that's not including new food technology, that's not considering nanotechnology, not considering any of that. Uh, also, the population in the uh, industrialized, industrialized worlds is actually on a decline except for immigration. Japan's an example where their population is on a decline because there's not much in, you know, immigration there. Uh, in this country, if it weren't for immigration, uh, we'd have a population decline. So I think that the more educated people get, the uh, less children, well, obviously, and we all know that, the more educated people get, the less children they have. The idea of life extension for almost a quarter of a century now. Uh, one thing that is hilarious that still comes up, really, is the idea of overpopulation. If you live a lot longer, won't the Earth become overpopulated? Well, you know, back in the early days of discussing these ideas, that was something people pressed pretty strongly because population was still expanding quite rapidly. But there's been a large demographic transition since then. Uh, many countries have reached zero population growth, or even beginning to decline. Um, USA has a, a larger population growth than most of Europe simply because of more immigration as well as you know, certain groups having more births. But overall, we're headed towards um, really the end of population growth in the world in a few decades. So the objections no longer has the same driving force, though it never really did have very much force in the first place. Because if you look at the mathematics of it, really what matters is how many children each couple has, not how long each person lives. That makes a relatively small difference. So even if, uh, even if that was a problem, it would be more reasonable to ask people to limit the number of children they have rather than to die. History has shown that you know, as population increases, productivity also increases. So you know, as we have an increased um, workforce to work at these problems, you know, we're going to have see an increase in solutions to these problems. We're going to see um, more ideas and uh, a greater workforce to actually apply these ideas. Overpopulation is a common one. So I can address that mathematically in that if people live longer, 
they tend to reproduce a little more slowly. I mean, in, in poor countries, people have five, six, ten kids because a lot of them are going to die. And that's where the population is growing the fastest. So overpopulation is a problem, but you slow the problem down by having people live longer and be healthier. So yeah, but all, the, all the concerns people voice about these things are, are the concerns of habit. They're the concerns that, that come out of the human condition as it's currently understood. Because the human condition, I mean, it, our whole culture, our, our, our assumptions, everything, what we consider to be, to be, to be poignant and, uh, and important and interesting stems from dying and aging. And it's, it's, everything is influenced by that. Yes. Um, so my mother uh, is fairly religious. And I've discussed these issues with her a few times. And she, she's religious, but she's also fairly open-minded. And I remember I said to her, you know, one time, well, you know, I don't ever want to die. And she just started laughing at me. And she said, oh, well, that's silly. You know, and because she's a scientist, she said something like, well, everybody has to die. And I said, well, no, you know, maybe if um, you have advances in biotech and stem cell research and you know, all these various things, we can actually live a really long time. And so she said, it's impossible. I, well, what do you mean it's impossible? People thought it was going to be impossible that, were, that we would go to the moon. We went to the moon. Oh, but that's different. How is it different? You know, and she just really, she was unwilling to accept the idea that it might be possible for human beings to live longer. And it's because she subscribes to this idea that there's this natural course of life um, and that there is a God and we all go through this cycle and we eventually wind up in heaven or hell, <laughs> depending on how you live your life. And she's really comfortable with that. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, people, as we talked before, that are just really uncomfortable with the idea of change. Um, and the idea that a society could be different where um, people would be around for a long time. It scares them. Uh, I know there are Luddites out there that uh, are fearful of change and new technology, but uh, the world's going to be a better place. Uh, there'll be more opportunities. Uh, there'll be, uh, as far as boredom, I mean, come on. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, it, it, you look over, over the past, uh, you know, our ancestors couldn't have gone skydiving or rolled roller coasters or, or done anything of that kind. And the options are only going to increase for us. The third thing I want to say actually about this very important thing is that actually these therapies when they first come along they will be very expensive but they'll also be rather dangerous because they'll be very experimental. So actually in a very real sense we should be thanking the wealthy for being the guinea pigs that will go there first. If you want it at all, you're going to have to let the rich have their, have their day in the, in the early days of the technology and in, in order to get it for everybody else. Right? I mean, early cell phones were incredibly expensive. Right, in the, in the eight, 1980s, mobile phones were thousands of dollars each. And now you go to China, and they're everywhere. This is a third world country. I mean, you go to Africa. People have cell phones in India and Africa. I mean, it's incredible how inexpensive cell phones are now, only 20 or so years later. And so that, the same impulse that would deny the rich life extension simply because they're rich and you can't, simply because you can't have it for other people is exactly the kind of policy that will destroy all technological innovation. People with greater means are going to have access to the best medical technology fastest. Um, but, I mean, you know, as, we, as we've seen in the past, these advances tend to make their way to the general populace for, fairly rapidly. Um, in 1922, they first discovered insulin. And this technology, you know, freed a lot of diabetics from needless death. And, you know, as we see today, you know, people of very modest means have access to insulin and diabetic treatment. Benjamin Franklin wrote to a friend in 1773, I wish it were possible to invent a method of embalming drowned persons in such a manner that they might be recalled to life at any period, however distant, for having a very ardent desire to see and observe the state of America a hundred years hence. Today, cryonics is the process of preserving humans after death by storing them in liquid nitrogen typically at a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius. In this cold storage state, metabolism and decay are nearly completely halted. 
viruses, bacteria, sperm, and eggs, embryos at early stages of development, insects, and even small animals such as small frogs and some fish can be cryogenically frozen, preserved for an indefinite time, and then reanimated back to full healthy life. Barring social disruptions, cryonicists believe that a preserved person could remain physically viable for at least 30,000 years. At least long enough for advanced medical technology to revive them. And we don't know what it's going to be that allows us to uh, reanimate and, uh, and be restored to uh, health and youth, um, if anything. But, as I'm fond of saying, it's a lot better odds to be frozen than to let the worms eat you. I think cryonics is a very logical uh, gamble, if you want to put it that way. Uh, uh, your next breath is a gamble. Someday it won't be there. But uh, I, I feel that the chances are very good of uh, a brighter future coming out of this. I certainly hope so. There's a, a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me that are wrong if, if not. And, uh, I never did like the idea of decomposing in a box. And actually one of the reasons that I decided cryonics was uh, the most effective approach was that there is no, so to speak, deadline for the development of the technology. If it takes an extra decade or an extra 20 years or an extra whatever to develop the technology to restore someone to good health, not a problem. Because I think if we, we powerfully you know, clearly show that argument, suddenly people will realize, well, cryonics kind of makes sense. It's a big gamble, but at the rate technology is developing, you know, however badly frozen these people may be, you know, a century from now, a millennia from now, there may be a very good chance they can be brought back. One of the essential themes for me as a physicist is, is asking the question, does anything in cryonics violate the laws of physics? And the answer to that is clearly no. There is nothing at all in the laws of physics that says this can't happen. And so it's important to realize that a lot of technologies that uh, people thought were completely impractical that had insurmountable barriers have been developed in the past 100 or 200 years. And, and yet people often, you know, detractors of these technologies often made arguments basically to the effect that the laws of physics, while not strictly prohibiting this, make it vanishingly unlikely. So people made arguments against rocketry, for example, basically saying there's, there's no way, there's no way that rockets will ever get off the surface of the Earth and go off to explore the planets, and, and they were wrong enough. And I think that it's a, if you take an honest look at the history of technological forecasting, scientists and engineers tend to be really bad at this sort of thing. Uh, I think that the remarkable thing about cryonics is that uh, you can get large percentages of the population to find it intriguing uh, if you just describe it to them, and even large percentages to find it plausible and um, something that they think there's a substantial chance it might work. But I've, as we all know, <coughs> an itsy bitsy tiny percentage of the population actually chooses it. So there's, there's a disconnect there, and that's one of the interesting puzzles about it. Really what started it for me is uh, since about the age of five I've wanted to be an astronaut. So that's, that's what I've aspired to be. And uh, a knee injury prevented me from even considering pursuing that career. And my hope is if, if cryonics works, that'll take me to a period in time where uh, I can fulfill those goals. I think they think I'm a little crazy sometimes. And I've talked about it on my interview show. I have, a, I interview, I have an interview show here in Santa Barbara called Alive After 65 and I've often talked about it encouraging people I, I think uh, you know I guess the religious people think it's not necessary because they're going to heaven anyway but the people who are agnostics or, or aren't so sure of their religion why I think it's a, a very wonderful alternative for hope that one will come back and see what's going to be happening in the in the world uh, in terms of cryonics, if, if, if there is anything negative, it's usually poor press or something like that, that that just exaggerates the wrong aspects of it. But I think that in, in the near future, people are just going to become aware of it, and it's just going to be a positive outlook. Uh, but as a general rule, when I first got involved, I encountered almost nothing but hostility when I would go into the field to collect a patient. 
Um, today that environment is vastly different already. Doesn't mean that people are going to be signing up for this themselves in droves, but at least they are not working as hard to prevent people from doing it. Got a long way to go, but um, I feel now that if you if, if a person dies today and they get a what we would call by today's standard a good suspension, in other words, there wasn't a lot of ischemic time and you didn't have an autopsy and the team was right there at your bedside, your deathbed, to start the procedure, that even though there's going to be quite a bit of damage compared to how we'll do suspensions in the near future, still, if, if you stay frozen long enough, uh, they'll be able to repair that. And one of the things, of course, is simply a new idea takes time to be absorbed. So one of the factors is we've had some more time. We've had some more decades during which people have gotten used to the idea, seen the idea, whether it's in movies and film and newspaper coverage, and are beginning to say, okay, I've heard of that, I can understand it. We're also seeing a number of technological advances that make the whole concept plausible. So for example, we're seeing advances in nanotechnology, and now it's quite reasonable to talk about manipulation and control at the molecular and cellular level. So this, again, adds to the technical feasibility. Obviously, the whole notion of cryonics requires basically two stages. There's a stage where you cool, and then there's a stage where you apply advanced technology to reverse anything that might have gone, might have happened during the, the cooling process and restore the person to good health. Historically, cryonics began in 1962 with the publication of The Prospect of Immortality by Robert Ettinger, founder and the first president of the Cryonics Institute in Michigan. The Cryonics Institute was uh, founded in 1976 and for many years it grew very slowly and for, me, for well, our first patient was my mother in 1977 and our second patient was my wife, my first wife in 1978 and then after that for quite a few years didn't have any patients uh, now we have uh, 68 and uh, half of those have come in the last five years and uh, of our members uh, I guess half have come in the last uh, about the last seven years something like that so obviously we have uh, gained ground and we're gaining it at an increasing rate uh, so we're we're still we're still very small, obviously, in absolute terms, or in relative terms, if you consider the population of the country, let alone the world. We're still very small, but then we're still growing only very slowly, but nevertheless, the rate of growth is, increased, is improving. And, of course, the wind is at our backs, because every year, almost every day, the advances in technology make our position more credible. And, uh, barring unforeseen calamities, uh, uh, the future looks okay, except, of course, that there will be untold numbers of individuals who miss their chance. Uh, I would like to think of this as a, as a uh, <coughs> extreme version of a hospital ward. Uh, we do call our, our uh, the people we have preserved patients. We think of them as patients. We try to treat them as patients. That about we challenge patients. Ionics, because when the Ted Williams case story came out, Alcor wasn't talking to anybody, understandably, because you know when it first came out. So the next thing the media would do is contact us or ACS, you know, any cryonics organizations, and we got a lot of calls from sports stations and stuff like that, and and a lot of people never even heard of it. They thought it was something brand new, and I was surprised at how few people actually heard about it. At the very first, before they actually froze somebody, when when Robert Ettinger first wrote the book, The Prospect of Immortality, which kind of launched this, at the very first when people didn't actually have to see a frozen body, before any, anybody was frozen, the idea of chronics was pretty well accepted. And uh, Robert Ettinger was uh, invited on the Johnny Carson show twice. They had articles in Playboy magazine and, and uh, this and that. And everybody thought it was really great until they had to look at a frozen dead body. And then they thought, wow, well, this is bizarre. 
Rudy Hoffman, an independent certified financial planner, has helped more people sign up for cryonics than anyone. A reasonable backup, just like when we were, if those of us who are in uh, information technology, if you're writing a long program or a long letter, a long document, imagine being 30 or 40 years in that document not hitting the save key. This is kind of a save key function. And again, not an end in itself, but a reasonable insurance. And of course, that insurance is in turn and funded by insurance. Uh, um, analogy of you know freezing a human body is like trying to warm up hamburger or some of these other nonsensical uh, comparisons. That may have been true in the 60s when we didn't know as much as we do today about the molecular structure of the body. But today, with vitrification, that problem is largely eliminated. Brian Wook, senior scientist at 21st Century Medicine, has been working with Greg Fay to develop an advanced method of cryonics, a less destructive preservation method called vitrification. We do federally funded research in hypothermic preservation of uh, hearts, preservation of kidneys, and uh, cryothermic, that uh, means very low temperature preservation of human corneas. And we also do research on uh, cryothermic cryogenic temperature preservation, kidneys, cartilage, and uh, brain tissue for pharmaceutical research. Uh, in vitrification, uh, chemicals are added to the tissues and the organs, which allow them to be cooled to virtually any temperature without ice formation, even hundreds of degrees below zero. We believe that this company's technology may very well be critical to successful deployment of bioartificial organs and engineered tissues, that will be needed to treat an aging population at least until such time as aging itself can be successfully and comprehensively treated in vivo. Contributor to Wired Magazine and author of more than 40 fiction and nonfiction books, Charles Platt is the director of Suspended Animation, a company specializing in standby procedures for cryonics patients. We're not going to make any money doing this. There is no money to be made in cryonics. A very common misconception is that there must be a huge potential demand and a huge potential amount of money to be made. This is not true. It's very hard to sign people up and they never want to pay very much. And the service itself costs a lot of money if you're going to do remote standby. It's very expensive. So the idea of suspended animation is to develop service in Florida and the rest of the nation do additional cases because you're no good if you don't do any cases. You don't find out all the things you should be doing. And I hope, personally, that if we set a good example here in terms of what can be done, other people may either want to do better than we are doing or they may want to imitate some of the things we are doing. And that's just fine. Have no proprietary feeling about any of the things we may create here. The more widely they are adopted, the safer that makes me as someone who wants to have those techniques for himself. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a cryonicist. I think that uh, it is something worth doing. Right now the uh, price for cryonics uh, at Alcor is $80,000 and this can be covered by life insurance. Uh, if you uh, start off very young, it will not cost you a lot of money. I'm paying only $85 for the uh, policy that uh, is sufficient to cover my chronic exp expenses. And uh, of course, it is not guaranteed to work, and uh, not everybody gets a high quality suspension. Uh, but uh, it is a wager that I'm personally willing to take uh, because at worst I'm losing $85 a year, uh, but uh, if everything goes well, I might uh, gain 100 years of life or more. Confined to a wheelchair after an accident which left him paralyzed from the chest down, James Swayze has undergone a transformation in his thinking about life and death over the past decade. Through the internet, James developed a virtual network which ultimately helped sponsor his cryonics policy. Bring in their discussions, and. I wrote a long rant and let him have it basically with both barrels. And I expected to get a hundred flame messages the next day and told, why don't you troll elsewhere, dude? And uh, 
to my astonishment, the next day, people calling out for pledges to, to cover me for suspension. For chronic suspension. In fact, Robert C. W. Ettinger, the actual father of cryonics, was one of them. And long story short, they just brought me into the community, and uh, nobody cared that that I, you know, dissed them all pretty badly. <laughs> And uh, and uh, pledges went on and on, and it got to about ten thousand dollars over the next well, about a year or so, and then it kind of languished there, and that's when Robert kicked it in his seat with thirteen thousand of his own estate, and with with the proviso that the other twenty thousand be reached through donations. Well, we had ten pledged for already, so we needed another ten. And uh, it wasn't long, and that was reached. And I'm fully funded for cryonics now with Cryonics Institute of Michigan. And I have this immortal debt I can't ever repay, but I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm working with the Methuselah Foundation for the M-Prize, and that's mprize.org. <laughs> and uh, it gives a little money each month, and I'm a volunteer administrator for the website, I'm just doing a small corner of it. And... Um, that's how I'm trying to, to pay back a little of what people have given me. This is a mouse prize uh, is a prize that uh, is set up to reward scientists, and it's really more of a, a scientists typically aren't money motivated, at least not all of them are, most of them aren't, um, but to reward them with monetary prize for achieving a milestone. And the milestone would be the, the scientist who takes a, let's say a two-year-old mouse, average lifespan is about three years, and um, sets a record for longevity for that mouse. It's, it's an interesting prize because it, it won't directly affect human lifespans because it's obviously it's about mice, but it's, it's, a, it's a positive step forward, and I like it because it's not as controversial as actually trying to make people live longer. Um, you can do a lot more with mice, and they've got such short lifespans, and it gets people focused on the problem. Because if we can make a mouse that normally only lives three years, and we can make it live six or seven years, granted, it's nothing compared to a human lifespan, but considering that in the last 70 years, with all our technology, all our studies into calorie restriction and genetics, the most we've gotten out of a mouse so far still isn't even five years. To be able to push that to six or seven years in a mouse that we didn't do anything medically for it until it was already in its middle age, I think that would really impress people to know that we could do that, that science has found a way to almost halt aging in mice. Oh, it's a, um stimulate research on the whole idea of, uh, of life extension in mammals. Um, I've been involved with a number of people, especially David Goebel, an entrepreneur from, from the um, Washington DC area, in uh, launching something called the Methuselah Mass Prize, which is um, administered by a non-profit 501c3 entity called the Methuselah Foundation. And the Methuselah Mass Prize is a very, very simple concept. It just says that you get some money if you create a mass that lives to a greater age than any other mouse has ever lived before, as far as we know. Um, and the amount you get is determined by, of course, the size of the prize fund, but you don't get the whole prize fund if you, if you do it. What you do is you get an amount of it that's determined by how much you beat the previous record by. Life extension consists of attempts to extend human life beyond the current maximum lifespan. Well, I, this is the weird thing about life extension or mortality. Um, I mean, there's a group of people who take it on themselves to say, you know, we're for this thing that most people seem to be against, and, and, and we really want to advocate for it. But in a certain literal sense, everybody wants to live one more day. Why is it difficult to get people to choose life over death? You wouldn't think that it would be all that complicated a question. I think that just by presenting it as this question and making a big deal over it, we forget how blindingly obvious the answer is. You know, if you're the sort of person who would not voluntarily walk off a cliff, then that means you're on the side of life. We can talk about that for many hours or many days for that matter, but uh, the bottom line is that 
or at least the simplest way to look at it is that most people most of the time would rather be alive than dead and most people most of the time would prefer to extend their lives if they could and that's all there is to it it's just a just another just a, just an extension of what we've always done which is to try to save and extend our lives if we can and use medical technology if that's uh, applicable and therefore i'm interested now in promoting the idea of, of cryonics and life extension generally from the point of view of do you really want to see the people close to you die? Do you want to go to their funerals? You don't. I don't care how religious you are, you don't want your family to die. So for their sake, you might think about this, or you might think they probably don't want to see you die. So maybe it's not just a selfish thing. Maybe it's good generally for any group of people if one or more of them can avoid premature death. I'm, I'm actually really optimistic that um, there's a lot that technology can do to help us live longer, um, you know, especially with advances in biotech and nanotech and um, artificial intelligence. I mean, all this stuff is really coming together. And uh, you know, I think we're living at a really good time in history where we're going to be able to take advantage of some of those technologies and live a really long time. We are more complex than model systems. We still don't know how to do this in humans, but there is no um, physical law preventing us from extending human lifespan. To a certain extent, it's the same in any industry. I, in the automobile industry, you can talk about you can talk about, uh, about hybrids or electric power for the longest time because you were a crank. In that case, you weren't going to get funding, so that just languished and languished and languished until eventually now it happens. I mean, you have to build this this critical mass, and I don't think the community is doing itself any great service by being quiet and under the radar. And in actual fact, Aubrey de Grey is, is pointing the way very clearly by being as loud and as vocal as he is. Um, and for my part, I'm really just one of a few people doing that critical little service of being a market maker for the conversation. If, if the government were to make a massive initiative toward life extension or toward artificial general intelligence, kind of Manhattan Project scale initiative, although not necessarily run in the same way as the Manhattan Project, I think you'd see a tremendous advancement just from getting the best people in each field focused on these problems and working together with those diehards who may not have the best technical ability, but have thought through the conceptual issues. Once we have that capability, longevity medicine will drive life extension. But we're not there yet. This is the Middle Ages. You know, this is, but I say in our lifetime, the next 25 years are going to be the most exciting, dynamic times for life extension because you're going to have longevity medicine that has the capabilities for this convergence of nano, bio, IT, and neuroscience to be able to actually understand. We'll have these tools, we'll have this insight, we'll see the precursors for a disease beginning, we'll be able to correct it. Now, every company in the world wants to, you know, the, the Medtronics of the world to make medical devices want to, you know, give you a device that will monitor that and to be able to help accelerate that. I mean, uh, we, we believe that ultimately, once we attain the biological immortality, which I believe is inevitable, that, that will occur, that, that cells will be programmed in such a way that they won't get old anymore, they won't turn into cancer, our, our vascular system will ma maintain its youthful, pliable uh, tone so that there will be no more atherosclerotic disease, will control autoimmune diseases that are so rampant in elderly people. Uh, people will live literally forever in a good, healthy state, but that risk of accident and trauma and just these unknown problems will, will motivate people to want to go a step further. And then that is uh, develop uh, artificial intelligence that can then take our biological emotions, which are nothing but chemical reactions in our brain anyway, in our memories, in our ident identities, and then transfer those into an electronic format that can be, then be backed up and stored in many places so that we will essentially have physical immortality. No matter what happens to that primary being, there will be backup disks uh, spread out in as many places as you can afford to keep them stored.
And I became convinced that intelligence is not really such an amazingly fancy trick. Not, not that it's trivial by any means, but uh, I think there's a lot of ways to make an intelligent system. Nature has discovered one, which is embodied in the human brain, and nature discovered it kind of haphazardly. The way that nature discovered to achieve intelligence has pluses and minuses, which we're all very familiar with. And it seemed to me that you could make uh, superior intelligence to humans in digital computers. Then once you have that intelligence, then all the other problems become easier. Then time travel is easier, making humans immortal is easier, because you have a, either a superior digital mind or a different kind of digital mind, which is complementary to yours, to help you discover everything you want to discover. And what I'm hoping to catch is those three neurons, as they develop, is their neurites spreading out and connecting up. And um, what I'm hoping is that we can build models of small cortical circuits in order to understand how the brain actually wires up and develops and learns and stores information from, from watching things like this. Because it's sitting on top of an electrode there, too, we can also observe them electrically. So we can see all the electrical activity in the network, and we can see the physical structure as well. So I'm, I'm working on ways to integrate that information so that we can build models and we can get better understanding of, of how the cortex, the mammalian cortex, actually works. These are my cells. Productive nanosystems from molecules to super products. Final production made possible by a challenge grant from Mark Sims and Nanorex Incorporated. Future advances in molecular nanotechnology will enable desktop appliances to manufacture products far better than today's best. The cartridges to the left supply simple raw materials to the machinery inside, here shown in schematic form. Products emerge from the top of this box, which holds the heart of the manufacturing system. Each product is built from beneath, layer by layer, by billions of tiny machines all working together. Near the top surface is the productive machinery itself organized into layers. Machines in the lowest layer process molecules into building blocks, passing them upward to machines that assemble them into larger components, and then to machines that add these components to the product. From a millimeter scale, one million nanometers, our view zooms in to the 10 nanometer scale. Each box is one-tenth the size of the one before. Here, at the molecular scale, nanomachines make small building blocks from molecular raw materials. The first machines sort molecules by their size and shape, passing some, rejecting others. Only molecules of the right kind can enter the processing machinery. These molecules contain four atoms, two of carbon and two of hydrogen. The molecules bind to a device that carries them to the next stage. Then, a rotating mechanism swings tool tips into contact with the bound molecules. Each tip presses a molecular tool against a molecule, bonding it firmly. The tools shown here have been analyzed using advanced quantum chemistry techniques. Another tool moves in from the left to remove the hydrogen atoms, leaving a pair of carbon atoms exposed and ready to use. The tools then carry these atoms to their destination, where each pair bonds to a nanoscale building block, making a tiny bit of crystalline carbon, a bit of diamond. Motions happen quickly at this scale. This scene shows motion slowed by a factor of more than a million. A conveyor carries the blocks past further machines, which build the blocks step by step to full size. Elsewhere, other specialized machines build blocks of different kinds. A system of conveyor belts and transfer mechanisms carries completed blocks from where they are made to where they are needed. This transfer mechanism moves blocks from one belt to another. The transportation system carries many different kinds of blocks, different shapes, different materials, different functions. It delivers them to the next stage of manufacturing. Here, a programmable machine lifts and places small blocks to make larger blocks. 
The small blocks bond on contact to form components containing millions of precisely arranged atoms. These can be simple structural bricks or intricate components for mechanical and electronic systems. The completed components are delivered to the final assembly stage, where many machines work together to build the final product. Motions at this larger scale are still quick. This scene shows motion slowed by a factor of 10,000. At the base of each machine, a transfer mechanism grabs components and lifts them from a conveyor. Each is flipped around, then carried up to the underside of the product under construction. Finally, machines lift the components and plug them in place, adding layer after layer to the bottom of the product. When the last layer is finished and construction is complete, the product is ready to be removed and used. The result of this production run is an atomically precise multiprocessor laptop computer with a billion times more processing power than today's best. The only waste products are warm air and pure water. Nanomedicine is the medical application of nanotechnology-related research. It covers areas such as nanoparticle drug delivery and possible future applications of molecular nanotechnology. The application of nanotechnology that people are most excited about is in medicine. Uh, we picture extremely powerful medical applications. Uh, being able to analyze the body down to the molecular level, do repairs at that level, uh, and in principle, one could um, address just about any disease you can imagine this way. Nanomedicine, a book series by Robert Fritas that analyzes a wide range of possible nanotechnology-based medical devices and explains the relevant science behind their design. Fritas writes that the net effect of all nanomedical interventions will be the continuing arrest of all biological aging, along with the reduction of current biological age to whatever new biological age is deemed desirable by the patient. You can sit here and discuss aging, and then, you know, ultimately I will sit and discuss nanotechnology because I view them as being, you know, what I've got to get is I've got to get f five years, then I've got to get ten years, then I've got to get twenty years for myself. If I get that much for myself, so, then, so at the same time, we, we find how we age and we find the treatment. We need to develop nanotechnology so to have the technology to apply right. those treatments. That's right. That's right. I mean, ultimately, we end up with nanotechnology. Ultimately, then, you know, we give you a whole new genome, or we do with the outloading, inloading, uploading, you know, path. Well, uh, I date the history of transhumanism back to an essay by Julian Huxley, where he penned the term transhumanism. His idea was a little bit more expansive than our contemporary idea of transhumanism. Uh, back in the 1950s, he was arguing that humanity should transcend itself, should consciously commit to transcending itself, both uh, biologically as well as socially. Transhumanism is an emergent philosophy analyzing or favoring the use of science and technology, especially neurotechnology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology, to overcome human limitations and improve the human condition that it makes sense. The whole concept of augmentation really clearly makes sense to me and I guess I, that kind of puts me in the middle of the uh, of the transhumanist, extropian, um, cryonicist movement. Uh, many of us are, of course are kind of free-thinking libertarians uh, who believe the whole idea that um, you know we should take what nature has given us and move to the next level as we clearly do. I mean most of us uh, if we our eyes are going bad we don't just say well nature's given us bad eyes let's not doing anything about it, we wear glasses. Or in my case, I had a radial keratotomy, which is one of the better operations. You were talking about, you know, different ideas that, or crux points where you change your paradigm. Actually, I think getting my uh, eyes fixed with a, at the time, very cutting edge operation, 10 or 10 or 15 years ago, a radial keratotomy, was a crux point for me, because I'd always had bad eyes, and. Um, all of a sudden, a single operation, literally and it took about eight seconds, and my eye, I woke up the next day with perfect vision, actually better than perfect, uh, uh, better than perfect vision.
In 1966, FM 2030 began to identify as transhuman, a shorthand for transitory human, people who were adopting technologies, lifestyles, and worldviews that were transitional to post-humanity. The only problem with transhumanism that I have is when they start talking about uploading your mind into a computer, I think that um, they usually oversimplify the problem of personal identity. They are not only too optimistic in thinking that the mind is just a pattern or some kind of uh, information processing uh, machine that can be just, you know, you can extract the software and the code and the data and upload it to a different media or to a different, you know, kind of machine and still be yourself. I think that doesn't work for two reasons. First, because of the identity problem. Most likely, that new creature you would be creating wouldn't be yourself anymore. You wouldn't have that sense of continuity. And second, they're, I think they don't understand what the human mind is. I think that it's a much more complex process. It's not only information processing. It has to do with some kind of experience that it is coded in our brain, but not in the same, same way as computer uh, codify information. The technological singularity, also referred to as just the singularity, is a predicted future event when technological progress and societal change accelerate due to the advent of superhuman intelligence, changing our environment beyond the ability of pre-singularity humans to comprehend or reliably predict. Uh, change is certainly accelerating. I mean, if I look at the big historical picture, there's no question that things are changing faster. A world that's going to be totally wired, a world with you know, deep sensors everywhere because they'll cost virtually nothing, a world that's capturing all of your experience and streaming it to these you know, indexable storage devices that allow you to call up those past experiences in ways your you know, biological memory can't do. Those are clearly coming. We can see the trend lines. Those aren't futures that are very disputable. What's disputable is how do we get the path we take down to that highly transparent society. Singularity seems to be the best option for handling that, or I'd be doing something else. I looked over all the possible ways that I could stop the dying. Artificial intelligence was the best, went into that. You know, I could start with the goals, look over your options, evaluate the options, pick the best one. You know, like don't try to rationalize it afterward. That's another one of the major rationality skills. Maybe even the major rationality skill. Intelligence to be useful must be used for something other than defeating itself. The development of superhuman artificial intelligence uh, could occur within the next uh, within the next 50 years, uh, perhaps as little as 20 years, uh, perhaps uh, longer than that. Um, so we should look forward to a lot of changes. When people think of the future, uh, they often think of robots and intelligent computers and so on. And there's a long history in science fiction and film and literature of these intelligent machines walking around. But that's really kind of a backward science fictional view. For the most part, there will be some autonomous robots, certainly. Um, there will be some stationary ones. I don't think many of them will be humanoid. We probably will have some because we're familiar with that. But it's not necessarily the best uh, physical form to take for most jobs. Most of them actually will be invisible. They'll be distributed. They'll be pervasive. They'll be ubiquitous. They'll be everywhere. And they'll be inside us, too. They'll be part of us, and we will be them. I don't think there'll be this rigid separation of AI and, and robots and human beings. I think more and more we will just interconnect. The, the, the band will be very permeable. We'll have little ro robots and nanomachines inside us. We'll have supercomputers inside our brains and inside our bodies and our watch, watches and earrings and whatever else. And they'll be sensitive to other machines in the environment and we'll really be very interconnected. Ray Kurzweil predicts in his book, The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology, that the advent of strong AI is the most important transformation this century will see. Indeed, it's comparable in importance to the advent of biology itself. It will mean that a creation of biology has finally mastered its own intelligence and discovered means to overcome its limitations. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I, I'm, I'm personally a big supporter, and I'm very excited about that. What we're talking about here is the, the singularity, uh, when machine intelligence becomes self-aware. 
And wow, I mean, what an amazing time to live in. Yeah, there, there are some uh, scary thoughts along that line, but uh, I, I think we'll adapt. Uh, we can incorporate that technology into ourselves. Uh, educational institutions will disappear once we incorporate that within ourselves. Uh, I know some people worry about coming back and having to re-educate themselves. I, I suspect before the end of the century, you'll be able to go into something like a 7-Eleven and pick up the, the latest half a dozen PhDs for $2 and you'll just, you'll install it. Um, now that doesn't mean we're going to be walking around like a bunch of tin can robots. Uh, we can look and feel just as uh, like we do now. Immortality is a concept of existing for a potentially infinite or indeterminate length of time. Technological immortality is the name given to the prospect for much longer lifespans made possible by scientific advances in a variety of fields. Nanotechnology, emergency room procedures, genetics, human physiology, engineering, regenerative medicine, and microbiology. Well, I, 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 do, I do use the word immortality, and I do use the word immortal, but I use it in a different sense, not to mean, not to mean invulnerability, obviously we can't be invulnerable, and not to mean living forever, because that's, that's not even meaningful, really, uh, but simply to mean indefinite life extension, or in other words, the elimination of so-called natural death. Oh, certainly. I mean, when you think of immortality, you think of uh, God or or the angels or something like that. You, it has a very mythical sense to it. Uh, so when you talk about, well, let's try to achieve immortality for, the, for humans, uh, it can lead to erroneous interpretations. But in a certain sense, even the immortalists are playing the same sort of metaphorical, symbolic game. That is, most people who think Quranics is cool don't sign up. Right? When it comes to taking a concrete action relevant for their lives, it's kind of like a, it's a disconnect, right? I had fun talking about this. It was exciting, but you know, what, you know, like, but, like life insurance forms? What? <laughs> you know, that, that's a whole disconnect. And in a certain sense, you know, fighting for immortality in general is, is well, as, in a certain sense, it's kind of silly because nobody's fighting against it when it comes down to living one more day. What you're fighting for is this image of, of an attitude people should have about the long future. And that's just fighting in this image world of, of, of stories to tell and, 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 and you know, symbols. DNA comes into us, we merge with the technology to live also indefinitely. Like the DNA, in a sense, is immortal. It's an oral cell. You know. um, so we get our immortality with the merger, which then buys us time to leave the solar system and go off into the universe, maybe mate with other beings. Uh, and then permeate the universe with consciousness in some way that might be a, um, uh, a, a pause in the entropic forces to figure out what we really want to do when we grow up, so to speak. Uh, so I would see, in a sense, immortality as being part of the long-range agenda, no pun intended, but because in a sense that's what matter and energy did to DNA. So DNA is doing with us with the mind and intelligence and machines and so forth. So it seems to me to be not an unreasonably, um, not an unreasonable position if you take the long stretch of, of, of matter and energy and time. So, everybody would agree with living long time. What it is, is with getting people to uh, donate their time and donate their money. That's the hard sell. Building a community. That's, that's where the problem lies, is, is having something concrete enough that people will invest their time or even uh, change some of the things that they've been brought up with. I mean, that's a very hard thing if you've been brought up as a Presbyterian or, you know, a Buddhist or <laughs> whatever, you know, you are. It's, it's very hard to uh, change some of those beliefs. It's not hard for me to talk to other people about immortalism. For me, it's just a, a natural extension. You want the best for your children. You want the best for yourself. Nobody chooses to die. In 2003, Russian scientist Igor Vyshev, who introduced the concept of immortology, the science of immortality, celebrated the 100-year anniversary of the death of Russian immortalist philosopher Nikolai Fedorov. Fedorov pioneered the concept that mortality need not be an attribute of human existence and called for the elimination of death. Humans, Fedorov said, can still be human even when they gain the ability to live forever. 
the problem of immortality is being developed for more than 150 years by Russian philosophers. The first great Russian thinker that we need to mention is Nikolai Fyodorovich Fyodorov, who has developed the philosophy of the common cause. Recently, the 100th year anniversary of his death was honored in December 2003. Fyodorov was the first to describe death as the result of spontaneous natural evolution. But by introducing the consciousness and the will of the people, he argued, it should be possible to apply the scientific knowledge to regulation of the spontaneous processes and remove the causes of death. The Mortality Institute is it brings together people who, for whatever reason, don't buy into the, the whole notion that there's nothing that can be done about aging. You know, there's... there's thousands and thousands of us out there that we've already found and probably tens of thousands or more out there who have this feeling that we can do something about aging but we haven't found somewhere to turn to because the 99.9% .9 of the rest of society tells us that there's nothing we can do about it. The ultimate goal for Eminst, I think, is to change people's perspective, change people's minds, that living forever is not a bad thing, that it can be done, and create an environment where people will feel not threatened, but comfortable, and allow research and technology on life extension to be an important topic, and to show other people that people who desire to live forever are good people, are normal people, and should have that right to live forever. The very fact of being able to find other people who think like you is very, very empowering for immortalists who haven't, if I can make a joke, uh, haven't come out of the closet yet. So you go into the website, you see other people think in a similar way as you do, you don't feel so much ashamed of your way of thinking. So slowly we're gathering together a body of knowledge that will become increasingly respectable. Now what I believe happens, I believe this happens with every movement, is at a certain point you, read a, you have the ideology, you have enough books, enough materials, enough arguments, enough answers to the hostile questions, and then something will happen. Well, first of all, I want to live indefinitely long. Uh, I'm not so sure that I want to live forever, but until further notice, if I can get away with it, I want to go on indefinitely um, and then subject to whatever I may do with all that time and what I may find out about the nature of reality and the nature of man. And uh, you see, my motivation for wanting to live indefinitely long is exactly that, is to find out the answers to what is the nature of reality, what is the nature of man, who am I, where am I coming from, what is the purpose of all this. Everything so perfect in your simple-minded world, the pixels light is shining in the moon's brightness. You know it's temporary cause all the goodness is vanishing And for now, your white wings are softly touching the velvety water Till it wakes up and all the dismay comes real Ice becomes fire, water's all you desire But no good is left, here to taste the death Come on, let me breathe to keep my heart bounding, pulsing with the cool breeze. Hey, oh, just don't let me freeze, yeah. It's like blue morning doesn't seem to be familiar. Too much lily and the sky is so relaxing. I live forever, but I feel something too good is happening. All these sounds cannot hold on for too long my own sanity One step closer to infernal eternity 
ice becomes fire. What is all you desire? But no good is left. Here to stay to death. Come on, let me breathe. To keep my heart pounding, pulsing with the cool breeze. Hell, you don't have to freeze. Yeah. Too damn good to be real. All this life can feel. Had the best and will all go away. The control overtake the dismay. Black would be the day. And dark shall be the night. When the time will be the best. The weekend shall wake up of the long depressed. Eyes become fire. What is all you desire? But no good is left. It just tastes the death. Come on, let me breathe. To keep my heart pounding. Pulsing with the cool breeze. Hell, don't let me freeze. Can't imagine it all this uh, fears vanishing like nothing isn't even worth my tears if it was I wouldn't cry now I 